Uh, hello, my name is Cliff Freilich. I'm the executive director of Cinema St. Louis. Welcome back to Golden Anniversaries. Um, we're happy to be joined uh, tonight by Charles Taylor. I'll be introducing him more formally in a moment or two, but I always have a few bits of housekeeping business to get out of the way. So let's get to that first. Uh, first, we always like to thank uh, our co-presenter, the St. Louis Public Library. We very much appreciate their support. They've helped enable this uh, particular uh, conversation series about the films of 1970. Uh, so shout out to them. Uh, very much appreciate their longtime support of uh, Cinema St. Louis generally, and of course, the St. Louis International Film Festival. I want to plug uh, next week's session. Uh, we're going to have a double bill. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. We're going to have uh, two sort of, uh, they sort of are precursors to the black exploitation genre. They are not really black exploitation. Uh, the Watermelon Man and Cotton Comes to Harlem. Uh, those are going to be discussed by Novotny Lawrence. Uh, Novotny was here to do our interview with Pam Greer several years back. Uh, he is an expert in uh, black cinema. He's written several books on black exploitation cinema. Uh, well, he wrote one and edited another. Uh, so I think it'll be a lot of fun having Novotny lead us through those two films. And then I wanted to make a note of the fact that we have finally rescheduled our double bill of Woodstock and Gimme Shelter that is now going to take place on November 2nd, the day before the election, uh, November 2nd. Sadly, uh, A.J. Schnock, who was originally scheduled to uh, handle those two films for us, uh, is probably gonna be shooting uh, on that particular day because he does a lot of election related work. Um, so he's not gonna be available, but I have recruited a terrific uh, substitute. His name is Daniel Dirkholz. Dan is an old colleague of mine from the Riverfront Times. He's written any number of books on music. Uh, so he's a music critic. You may have read his work, not only in the RFT, uh, but also in the Post-Dispatch. Uh, so that's on November 2nd. Last uh, tonight, of course, is Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Uh, and I wanna put in a plug for the lens. We have some essays up. Uh, one, a uh, Russ Meyer Top 10 by Tom Stockman, who's the editor of We Are Movie Geeks. He, he is a uh, massive fan of Russ Meyer. So he's offered his top 10. And then one of the regular lens contributors, Joshua Ray, has written an essay on Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. So after you hear Charlie talk about uh, the film, we encourage you to also check out what Josh has to say. And I, I suspect Josh might be on this session, so he may uh, weigh in with a question or two for Charlie. Okay, uh, now let's get down to business. I wanna introduce Charles Taylor. Uh, Charlie came to the fest, oh gosh, it's been more than 10 years ago now, uh, maybe 15, 16. Um, to be a co-jury head uh, with Stephanie Zaharik, uh, Time Magazine now, uh, film reviewer, uh, of our New Filmmakers Forum. We had a great time with him. We've been trying uh, without, uh, without success and uh, to lure him back here. Uh, one year we thought we had him and then uh, things fell apart because of uh, weather related concerns in New York City because of uh, uh, the superstorm. But at any rate, uh, we're happy to have him virtually, uh, even though that we can't have him live. Uh, I particularly wanted Charlie to participate in this, uh, in this Golden Anniversaries because he's written an absolutely wonderful book that I strongly encourage everyone to go out and purchase. That's opening Wednesday at a drive-in or theater near you, The Shadow Cinema of the American 70s, uh, which deals not with the sort of a uh, major films that we all think of as being uh, 1970s landmarks, and there are plenty of those, but rather the sort of uh, films that were just below the radar, equally compelling in many ways, but not as well known and not necessarily as well respected. And he does an absolutely wonderful job of unpacking those films and telling us why we should be paying attention to them. So uh, he, uh, he was the first person I actually contacted uh, about this and uh, He's also the former, uh, film, uh, former film critic for Salon, and he's taught film, so he's got plenty of other credits, but that book is one of the reasons why I particularly wanted him to participate in this. So I offered him his choice of all the films we were playing, and he picked, and I, I, it wasn't a surprise to me, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. I'm going to now turn things over to Charlie, and I'll rejoin 
for conversation later, and you should uh, queue up uh, to offer your questions and comments. You might want to wait till after Charlie's uh, intro uh, before you do it, because he may address some of the questions that you have. But please, we want to hear from you too. All right, Charles Taylor. Cliff, thank you so much. Um, it's really nice to be doing this. Um, it's really terrific to, uh, to be with you, even virtually. And um, I just want to say thank you for asking me and um, thank Cinema St. Louis. And I want to thank the folks who have uh, tuned in to see, uh, to watch this. And a uh, special uh, hello to Kathleen. If you're watching, love you, thinking of you. Um, the first thing I'd like to say about Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is this, uh, which is that my affection for this movie is not a case of it's so bad it's good. I think that's a pretty cheap and easy way to look at movies. It's easy to feel superior to a movie. Um, my affection for this film is real. My admiration for it as a piece of filmmaking is real. I think it's a smashing piece of filmmaking. and. Um, I think it knows exactly what it's doing. But it does require some backstory to get into it. And so I'd like to start with two things. One is Jacqueline Suzanne, and one is 20th Century Fox in the 1960s. Um, we forget now just how big a novel Valley of the Dolls was when Jacqueline Suzanne published it in 1966. When she died eight years later in 1974, it was the biggest selling novel of all time. I think it, to date, it's something like 31 million copies in print. Uh, unfortunately, it's a book that has also been treated dismissively. It is in the tradition of what you might call the famous American dirty book, uh, the obvious precursor being uh, Peyton Place. Uh, and like Peyton Place, Valley of the Dolls isn't a literary work, but I'd still argue it's a good novel and an important one because what it lacks in, in nuance or subtlety, it makes up for in candor. Uh, it tells the audience truths that it knew, but perhaps didn't want to admit knowing. There is a precursor to the book, a, a 1950s novel by Rona Jaffe called The Best of Everything, which is about three what we would then call career girls trying to make it in New York City. And um, Suzanne transplanted the novel to New York and Hollywood and wrote about what she knew had happened in show business. So on the one hand, it's, it belongs to the scandal novels that people like Harold Robbins wrote, taking famous people, disguised versions of famous people, and, and writing about scandalous incidents. But it's also, I think, a genuine pre-feminist novel. It's a version of what Betty Friedan, writing three years earlier in The Feminine Mystique, called The Problem with No Name. It's about the unsatisfying choices that faced women, the, the desire for freedom and independence, but the nagging sense of you being missing something if you go for that. Uh, it doesn't tidy things up with a happy ending and it doesn't lie to its audience, which is what makes the movie version of it that came out in 1967 a little bit strange because the strange thing about Valley of the Dolls, like the film version of Peyton Place, was that because of the movie production code, the things that had drawn people to the novel were missing in the movies, that same candor. The production code was pretty much falling apart by 1967, but there was still enough of it left intact that some things had to be soft peddled. Uh, the same director, Mark Robeson, did the films of both Peyton Place and Valley of the Dolls, and Jacqueline Suzanne called his version of Valley of the Dolls a piece of shit. But the movie was still an enormous success. Uh, and in fact, it was one of the few bright spots for 20th Century Fox in the 1960s. Earlier in the decade, the studio had almost gone under when the cost of Cleopatra had spiraled out of control. 
Um, and in the same month that Valley of the Dolls was released as a film, which is December of 1967, the studio also released their big musical, Dr. Doolittle, which was a big bomb, and they lost a great deal of money on it. So come 1969, Fox is looking for a way to make money, and they're hoping that a sequel to Valley of the Dolls would be the ticket. And they're also hoping that they could do something like what had happened with Easy Rider at Columbia. Easy Rider had been made for $350,000 and had been a huge success, earning millions for Columbia. So Richard Zanuck, who was then the head of 20th Century Fox, approached Ross Meyer about doing a sequel to Valley of the Dolls. And Meyer had been working successfully for years making what they called nudie cutie movies, uh, pictures like The Immoral Mr. Tease. And he had been working very cheaply and very profitably. Uh, the thing specifically intrigued Zanuck was that Meyer's 1968 film Vixen had been made for $73,000 and had um, made $8 million. And that was something that Zanuck was hoping that um, Meyer could reproduce for 20th Century Fox. Well, Jacqueline Suzanne had written the script, but it was a script which the studio rejected. And when Meyer came on board, he was pretty much allowed to go his own way. And one of the first things he did was hire Roger Ebert, a critic who was just a few years into his career at the time, and who had written admiringly uh, about Meyer's movies. Um, and the way that they decided to go was by setting up a parody of what Suzanne's story was, a parody of three girls trying to make it in show business. I should note, that Suzanne hated this movie so much, she sued 20th Century Fox, saying that the film damaged her reputation. And the lawsuit was finally won uh, after she died, and uh, her estate won $2 million. But um, that lawsuit is part of the reason that the studio tiptoes around the connection to Valley of the Dolls. You remember at the beginning of the film, it says, this is not a sequel to that story. And the advertising uh, used the line, this is not a sequel, there has never been anything like it. Well, give 20th Century Fox credit for truth in advertising because that's certainly true. Now, of course, there had been pictures like this before, pictures that claim to show you the real dirt of show business. And they usually ended up seeming phonier than the thing that they wanted to rip the curtain away from. Hollywood pretending to tell the truth about itself has always seemed rather phony. Well, Meyer and Ebert wanted to send up that notion of expose filmmaking. They wanted to send up Hollywood's pose that it was telling the truth about itself. And they did that by making a movie that in every respect seems as artificial as possible. Now, this is what Ebert said about its making. Russ Meyer wanted the film to appeal in some way to almost anyone who was under 30 and went to the movies. There had to be music, mod clothes, black characters, violence, romantic love, soap opera situations, behind the scenes intrigue, fantastic sets, lesbians, orgies, drugs, and eventually an ending that tied everything together. And so Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is a parody of youth culture. It's a parody of rock and roll. It's a parody of social problem movies. When the Manson murders occurred, as they were beginning to write the film, they decided to throw that into the mix as well. And it's an irony that Quentin Tarantino, when he announced that he was doing a film that was connected to the Manson murders, got slammed and was accused of doing something exploitative and turned out the very loving uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I say very loving because of its tenderness towards that time and that place, um, he got uh, a lot of grief for even attempting the subject, which Myers uh, never did, uh, nor did John Waters, who, uh, though I love him, it has to be noted, 
uh, dedicated his film Female Trouble to one of the Manson murderers. But the description that Ebert gives of what he and Meyer were doing is a description of a movie that wants to do too much. And it's that sense of too muchness that makes it feel so fizzy and so crazy. The sense that nothing here is to be taken straight. Too muchness is, Ro uh, is Russ Meyer's whole visual style. I mean, first of all, from the physiques of the women he cast, two of the cast members here, Dolly Reed, May 1966, and Cynthia Myers, December 1968, were Playboy Playmates. Um, also, the too muchness that I'm talking about is visible, I think, in the editing style of, uh, of this movie, and indeed of all Russ Meyer's movies. Um, in his notes to the Criterion release of the film, uh, Mr. Glenn Kenny of Fort Lee, New Jersey, noted that Russ Meyer doesn't move his camera, and he doesn't. The entire sense of movement is created by the editing, which isn't so fast that you can't see what's going on, but it's fast enough that it often makes you feel you see what you're seeing on the rebound. Now, this was the first time that Meyer ventured into a cosmopolitan setting. Most of his pictures worked on what he called the formula of boobs and roofs, which meant he had rural settings and hillbillies. Um, in this picture in Los Angeles, you get the feeling he loves the plasticity of the world he's showing you, the clothes and the decor and the tacky swank of it all. Meyer liked to call himself the rural Fellini, but the way he creates a sense that everything here is orgiastic excess, I think shows much more control, much more wit, and frankly gives the audience much more pleasure than Fellini did when he was allowed to run wild. In the dialogue alone in this film, you have things that are parodies of romantic melodrama, you have stuff that might come out of pornographic paperbacks, and you have the Shakespearean travesty that Z-Man provides throughout the entire movie. Now, Roger Ebert wrote a Pulitzer Prize for film criticism. I'd say he deserved another for coming up with a line like, before this night is through, you shall know the black sperm of my vengeance. I bow before that line. Um, apart from the love scene here between Cynthia Myers, who plays Casey, and whose lost melancholy quality, I have to say, I find very touching, and Erica Gavin as Roxanne, there's barely a moment in the movie where we're meant to take emotionally straight. Everything else is parody. So why doesn't it wear you down? I think because you have throughout the movie a sense that what you're seeing cuts through the bullshit and the sentimentality that Hollywood routinely asks you to swallow. There's pleasure to be had in biting the hand that feeds you when what it's feeding you routinely is pablo. And because Hollywood has so often tried to claim that the titillation it showed was in service of making a moral point, the epitome of that being the flesh that Cecil B. DeMille always put into his biblical ethics, Meyer and Ebert can't resist that wonderful end lecture on the moral lesson each character has learned. This is a particular failing of art, not just trash, not just trashy melodrama, like the type of thing that's being parodied here, but there is a weakness in American art for something that ties up the end, that gives you a nice moral to go out with that makes sure we know precisely good from bad, right from wrong. And it's refreshing to see the parody of, in this movie of that kind of sentimental moralism. And yet it has to be said that if this movie is a put on, it's also something of a square put on. The movie's satirical to be sure, but you can imagine that without Meyer's dynamism, its view of the counterculture might feel something like what happened when hippies turned out on Dragnet, or it's what happened when Hefner thought that he could make playmates look like campus activists if he put them in body paint and headbands. The movie makes fun of a square like Porter Hall for believing the life of the young is an endless orgy 
and yet it almost has that expectation itself. I put it this way, you're not making any case for your own hitness when your idea of 60s rock is represented by the strawberry alarm clock. But the movie is on the side of the Carry Nations and their friends. This is clearly not a movie for the sensitive. There are gay jokes and trans jokes. There's even a Holocaust joke that goes by very quickly. It's not a movie for people whose highest standards are good taste or refinement or people who think that movies should be an edifying experience. It's brash, it's vulgar, it's gaudy. And for me, it's also joyous and giddy and energizing. Um, the notes on the sign up online for the discussion called this movie transgressive. And I think it is transgressive, but in a way that Meyer and Ebert couldn't have known at the time. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls was a huge hit. Russ Meyer made it for $900,000 and it made 10 times its budget back. Um, and one of the reasons it was such a hit was that it came at a time when people were looking to movies for what had always been denied them in movies. And in this case, that was sex. Audiences were sick of the coyness with which Hollywood treated sex. And when you become used to that, even the honest exploitation approach of this movie seemed refreshing. We're celebrating this 50 years after it was made when, let's be frank, sex doesn't exist in American commercial movies today which is strange when you think about it because today American commercial movies are almost completely aimed at teenage boys who, as I remember, used to be interested in sex. But now comic books and adaptations of fantasy rules, they've taken over the culture in a way that doesn't allow for emotion or psychology or even really coherent storylines. Spectacle has replaced narrative in the movies. It doesn't even really allow for movie stars who aren't advertised in the trailers or the print ads for these pictures that are being made. Also, right now in America, we're in one of those moments that keep popping up every few decades when we exist in a moral panic, specifically now a sexual panic. We've gone from good reason for celebrating that real sexual predators have been taken down to believing in both art and in life that something as complicated and messy and powerful as sex can be conducted or portrayed with the politeness and rules of the Japanese peace ceremony, which is why we have people now on the left as well as on the right questioning whether or not due process is a good thing. It's why we have an insane conspiracy theory that's becoming part of our legislative and probably our executive branch it's why we have charges of pedophilia being lobbed at the French film cuties. And it's why many writers I know, most of them female right now, feel they can't, can't honestly write about their sexual attitudes or experiences for fear of running afoul of online mobs who want to treat public figures as potential candidates for re-education camps. So it's in that context that I think a horny and funny and impolite and unpolitic movie like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is a real reason for celebration. If I were in the movie, what I'm about to say would probably be ruthlessly parodied, but I think in its own trashy, crazy way, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls reminds us what it was like to live in the saner and freer America. And Cliff, as they say at the Senate hearings, I'll be happy to take your questions. <laughs> All right, terrific, Charlie. That was a lot of fun and uh, very insightful. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, I want to again invite the people who are listening to weigh in with questions and comments. Uh, I will start uh, as we await for uh, uh, questions to arrive. Uh, I'm curious as to what you think of Russ Meyer's work overall beyond Beyond, beyond the Valley of the Dolls, what are your thoughts on his larger filmography? I, I think this is the one where he got it completely right. Um, I mean, there are other movies I like. There are some I haven't seen. Um, I, I, I like Vixen. I, I love Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Um, I enjoy Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens uh, a great deal. Um, I think at times... 
the things that don't happen in this film uh, happen in the others. Sometimes there's, um, the humor has a mean edge. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a repetitiveness that feels like, um, it feels a little bit of a trudge to get through. But um, I think he's a real, I mean, this is, I think Meyer's a real barnyard sophisticate. And I, I don't mean that as, as a slam act. Um, I think there's, there's something, for the most part, sort of refreshing about that, um, that formula of um, lascivious humor and, uh, and pulchritude combined with this, you know, I think it was Ebert who once said his editing style is somewhat like Eisenstein. I, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's too much. Uh, and if I'm being honest here, and I hope, you know, as a critic, I have to be honest, the difference between, for me, between Russ Meyer and Eisenstein is that I admire Eisenstein, but I enjoy Russ Meyer. <laughs> I'll just uh, briefly note the fact that I have not seen uh, almost any other Russ Meyer film with the exception of Super Vixens, which I was lured into by a blurb from Roger Ebert. I mm -hmm. was uh, a young innocent at the time and didn't realize that Ebert was a former collaborator uh, of, uh, he didn't review the film, but he nonetheless lent his name to the mm -hmm. advertisement. And so I went with a friend of mine and I, to be honest, and I would probably need to revisit the film. I was truly appalled by the movie. Uh, uh, the combination of sex and violence, particularly there's one sequence in which a, a woman, if I recall, is electrocuted in the bathtub and the person mm. stomps on top of her. Uh, yeah. I just found it like uh, cringe inducing. It really disturbed me in a serious it's way. It's an ugly scene. I will grant you that. It's an ugly scene. Uh, so at any rate, I, my experience with Meyer is very minimal, but I, I have encountered many many people who have uh loved his work so i was very curious as to what your overall take on on his filmography was um i'm curious too i know you're a big music fan and that you're very knowledgeable in that area you obviously are somewhat dismissive of the strawberry alarm clock and their status as a psychedelic rock band and being representative of the music at the time but i'm curious as to what you thought of the carry nations themselves and the music that they play it's you know it's for what it is it's not bad um one of the songs in this movie I genuinely love, uh, In the Long Run, which is, uh, you know, a soft ballad. Um, the singer Maria McKee uh, did a version of that on a live album she released in um, the first decade of this century. And she introduces the song by saying that she likes to ride around LA in her vintage Mercedes pretending she's one of the girls in the movie. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think they're, um, they're good serviceable numbers. There's Stu Clifford of the Strawberry Alarm Clock who did the songs for this. And I think for the most part, they're serviceable numbers. I enjoy listening to them when I hear the movie. I do have to say that I find it uh, bizarre. The range of that voice is pretty amazing. <laughs> Since obviously there are two people yeah. who are actually voicing, uh, voicing the, the songs. So they're wildly distinctive. Uh, uh, so her ability to um, uh, be this sort of uh, almost blues mama belting things out and then also have this more ethereal side is, is very impressive. Yes. <laughs> but you know, the thing is music in movies Music in rock and roll movies, it's very hard to, to evaluate it on its own apart from the movie. Um, you know, the, the final number that Diane Lane's character in Walter Hill Streets of Fire performs is, is written by Jim Steinman, who did Meatloaf stuff. And if you listen to it on the record, you know, it's okay. It, it sort of lies there. When you see it the way it's done in that film, it seems overwhelming. 
it seems like this gargantuan thing. Um, and so it's very hard for me to separate out what, uh, to separate out any question of the quality of this music from my own feelings of, of pleasure in the film itself. Uh, on that level, uh, well, actually, we have a question, uh, so let me uh, let me ask that first. Okay. So Benjamin Het asks, "Beyond seems like a reaction to the end of the production code. Then how do you think we get from there culturally to the moral panic you describe today?" Um, the quick flip answer, uh, Mr. Het, is uh, forty years of Republican rule. Um, and, but th that's, that's an easy answer. How we get there is, um, how we get there is a polity on both sides of, of the spectrum that have, um, have really abandoned liberal values. And I, I mean liberal values in, in not just the political sense, but more in the, the artistic sense and the classic sense. Um, I think when you have, when you have um, a political mindset, no matter what side you're on, that believes that the certainty of issues and the, the certainty of, of social, uh, progress, the, the, the things people feel have to be done for social progress, when you feel that that has, is translated to art, which is not about providing easy answers and not about right and wrong and not about easy choices, um, when you feel that those things should be put into the creative process, that the purpose of art is to impart moral instruction, then um, you have people very, uh, you have a public that's very easily, you know, very willing to give up the freedom that a lot of filmmakers fought so hard to get on the screen. That's a sort of tortured answer to that question, but I, um, I think it's, it's the only thing that I can, I can think of. Um, because there really is no sex in American movies right now. Um, you know, none. Um, I mean, think of even in the good action or fantasy movies being made. Think of John Wick. You know, I, I love those fir the first two John Wick movies. I'm not crazy about the third one, but John Wick's not going to stop and have a dalliance with someone like, uh, like, James Bond did because he's holding the candle for the memory of his dead wife. Um, and when you do that, it, it maybe gives a soulfulness to the character, but it also knocks a little bit of sensuality out. I think all of those observations are quite apt. Um, we have a question from Joshua Ray. Josh is a, a critic for The Lens, our film, uh, Cinema St. Louis blog. He hey, says, Josh. hi, Charles. I wrote about the film for The Lens last week. One of my favorite qualities is its balance of parody and homage to the Hollywood narratives. And before you uh, weigh in on that, I'd like to read a little quote, because I figured this would come up, from Ebert himself. And that is, uh, in the movie as a whole, I think of it as an essay on our generic expectations. It's an anthology of stock situations, characters, dialogue, cliches, and stereotypes set to music and manipulated to work as exposition and satire at the same time. It's cause and effect, a wind-up machine to generate emotions, pure movie without message. Uh, so obviously Ebert was thinking along those lines himself. I'm curious as to what you might want to add to that. I, I think Josh's observation about the affection for movie forms is very apt because if this, if there was no affection in this, um, I don't think there would be any joy. I don't think people would 
you know, would remember this or experience it with the pleasure they do or talk about the craziness of it. On some level, there is a realization of just how insane those movie, the stock movie melodramas are and, you know, and how we enjoy them for that. There's that great moment at the end when Marsha McBroom says, someone's in there, what is her line? Someone's in there and I, you know, he's missing a head, which <laughs> is this. Um, there are often, uh, you know, Joshua would, would probably know what I mean when I talk about those directors who use melodrama not for um, parody, but use the very craziness of it to get to some sort of heightened emotional experience. I mean, Elma Dovar did that in his early films. Um, even though I think he does it very coolly and very analytically, that's what Cirque does. Um, and there are times when you see filmmakers loose in melodrama and loose in the craziness of it and you feel like their true selves are coming out as filmmakers. Um, Paul Schrader did a movie that has never been released to theater as a wonderful picture called Forever Mine, which uh, it, the only way I can describe it is imagine Douglas Sirk doing Count of Monte Cristo as a parable of the Nixon years. <laughs> and Schrader's never made anything as emotionally free or generous as that movie. So I think the, the affection that Joshua talks of is, uh, is very much there. And uh, I think it's a terrific observation. Uh, he continues, by the way, he wants to know what you make of Meyer, his fetishes being written large in his films and some feminist readings like B. Ruby Riches, loving Meyer's on-screen women. Uh, how much of a feminist is Mr. Meyer? Probably not. And I mean, probably not. And so what? Um, he, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what B. Ruby Rich uh, said uh, about him. Um, I have to say, uh, whenever anybody says the name B. Ruby Rich, uh, I knew her parents. Uh, uh, I have never met her. I knew her parents and they were lovely people. So whenever anybody says uh, Ruby's name, um, the first thing that goes through my mind is a memory of just how lovely her folks were. Um, I didn't know she had written about Russ Meyer. I didn't know she, she liked him, but you know, the, mo the women are independent in his movies. They're not, uh, they're not doormats. Um, so, uh, are these strong characters? They're not passive characters. Um, my point is that, I mean, going along with what I'm saying earlier about art not being about ideology or not being about moral lessons, um, whether he is or isn't a feminist is um, not important to me. Um, I would say it is more important for him maybe not to be since any ideology, I think, restricts art, even worthy ones. Uh, I was going to ask uh, before we start to have our questions pop up about another music related aspect of the film, and that is uh, Z-Man uh, and the fact <laughs> that uh, he was obviously loosely inspired uh, by Phil Spector. Uh, right. Uh, so I'm just curious as to, one, your thoughts on Spectre himself, and then, of course, uh, what you think of as this sort of uh, very outlandish portrayal of him uh, via Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Well, how outlandish is it if Phil Spectre is where he is now? Um, <laughs> behind I mean, bars, for those Behind bars know. for murder, right. I mean, there are two things that are, um, you know, it seems to me evidently true about Phil Spector. One, he's a genius, and two, he's absolutely batshit crazy. Um, and those stories were out there well before he was ever accused or, or, or convicted of murder. Um, 
so uh, yeah, I think that um, I think it's you know I find Z Man amusing, but and I realize oh okay he's supposed to be Phil Spector, but finally he's Z Man to me um, or Superwoman, but uh, Z Man because he's you know, he, uh, John Lazar goes through the movie with those Shakespearean parodies, those Shakespearean soliloquies. And you, you very soon leave thoughts of, of Spectre behind. Because I think this character is one of the, even before the, the big reveal, he's one of the things that make you say, what the hell am I watching? You know, whose idea was this? And how do you carry it through uh, for an entire picture? So, yes, he is a, a totally unique character. I, I don't know that there's any precedent in film for uh, for Z Man. Uh, speaking of the cast, and you know, he was uh, played by John Lazar. Uh, most of the people who actually appear in this film are reasonably new to film, and then many of them did not go on to have yeah. significant careers subsequently. I'm yeah. just curious as to what you think of. I mean, obviously, it's a very bizarre and stylized performance mode that's being used here. Yeah. Eber talks about how Meyer achieved that. Uh, I'm just curious as to what you think of the performances in this. Well, they do their, I mean, they, they, they serve their purpose. Um, you know, and Ebert says that Meyer talked to them straight, didn't want them to approach this to be funny, because if they were, then it wouldn't be funny. You have to do it straight. I saw the movie on screen a few years ago, uh, and Marsha McGroom was there. Marsha McGroom, who pay, plays Pet, was there to introduce it. And she, um, for many years, uh, worked uh, as an advisor to the New York Board of Education. She worked for the United Nations. She taught Spanish in New York public schools. And she pretty much confirmed what Ebert said about how, uh, how the, the actors were directed. Um, you know, I, I think that they are... Um, each of them fulfills the part they're meant to fulfill. The one that gets to me, as I said, is Cynthia Myers, who I find very touching. I just find there's something, you know, very sweet about her whole affect. Um, and there's a lovely moment in the Criterion uh, disc where she and Erica Gavin uh, reminisce uh, about their love scene. And it's obvious that, uh, they had great affection for one another and that, you know, Meyer, according to them, treated them very well and wanted that scene to come off as, as tender. I mean, the people who stand out for me in the movie, apart from Cynthia Meyer, are Erica Gavin, who I think can act, uh, who was good in Vixen and good in um, uh, Jonathan Demme's movie, Caged Heat, and, um, and uh, Charles Napier, who just comes in with that absurdly square jaw of his. And um, I, you know, I, there was never a time when I saw Charles Napier in a movie when he didn't make me smile. I was surprised to discover in doing a little uh, reading about the film uh, in preparation for this, that Michael Blodgett, who plays uh, the gigolo Lance Rock, uh, eventually became a novelist and screenwriter who was responsible of, for all things. Uh, uh, Turner and Hooch uh, was a, a film that he wrote. So uh, that was a bit of a surprise. And he was responsible for one of Tom Hanks's best performances. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who, who worked with him who spoke, um, speaks very fondly of the logic. Um, remembers him with, uh, with real affection. The other male lead of the film, of course, is Harris, played by David Gurian, who, uh, from what I can gather, made no other films. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Um, 
I am curious, you know, you referenced the fact that uh, obviously Quentin Tarantino came under some fire for uh, daring to um, exploit the Manson murders, as you quite uh, rightly said, it ended up being more of a, a very sort of tender uh, yeah. homage to Sharon Tate and uh, you know, it was, I, I think, uh, uh, certainly not valid criticism that was all offered in advance. But as you say, this film uh, happened right on the heels. And of all things, Sharon Tate was in the original Valley of the Dolls. Right. So it's even more shocking on some levels. Right. Uh, it's, you know, as I said, I, I mean, there's no, you can't defend it from a taste point of view. Um, uh, do you know do i cringe a little maybe a little but i also feel that i mean for me the movie takes place in such a crazed universe a crazy made-up universe that the the um it touches reality uh fleetingly shall we say <laughs> Uh, Ebert uh, also notes somewhere in that essay that he wrote about the film that one of the things that surprised him about when he and Meyer were briefly uh, engaged to do a biopic, I guess, of the Sex Pistols, that Johnny Rodden uh, yeah. was um, said he admired Beyond the Valley of Dolls because it was so much like real life. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, they shot three days and that was uh, it. Yeah. Who killed Bambi? was the was what the movie was going to be called um yeah what that would have been like god knows um meyer did, film. go ahead meyer said that working with steve jones and paul cook uh the band's guitarist and drummer said they were you know very easy to deal with i mean at that point i think sid bishop was a casualty uh you know a walking casualty and um you know, Johnny Rotten, John Lydon, uh, for whatever you can say about him, uh, the man's a hero. Uh, the man uh, is, uh, you know, he, he did what he did. He stood up for it. He took uh, much more abuse and much more real physical threat and danger than a lot of, uh, a lot of, artists ever have and um you know whatever his shortcomings in some ways uh i think he's a man who deserves our respect and he has mine <laughs> uh, my most vivid this is way off topic but uh, my most vivid memory of uh john uh, john lyden is uh, an appearance on american bandstand by uh public image limited in which he uh, essentially totally abandoned ship on any sort of lip sync right uh, and made a shambles of the show. It was really an amazing. It was uh, wonderful. He pulled kids <laughs> from the audience up on stage to dance. And that was, I mean, the complete character. You're part of this. You know, it's if if you think of punk as something breaking down the barrier between audience and performer, then that was right in character. All right, well, let's get back on track here. We have some more uh, observations and questions from the audience. Charles Jacobson asks, explain the plot, or what is the function of the plot, or are there plotlets strung together? Does this film give inspiration to us with weak or confusing plots? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what the questions are. Um, the plot is... Um, uh, the plot is about the oft times nightmarish world of show business. Uh, as, as Mr. Meyer himself said, it's about uh, three innocents who come to Hollywood, who make it, who lose their innocence in the process of making it, and then find it back again. Um, it takes place, the, uh, it takes place in the world of artificial Hollywood melodrama. And um, that is, I think, the meaning that there is. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I really don't know what else to say. I think the, uh, the film obviously sort of enjoys moving in uh, different tangents to, right. uh, uh, and that's very much part of its right. uh, aesthetic. It, yes, it's very restless. It's a very restless movie. And 
you know, that's what the editing style does. Uh, and it keeps going from character to character, thread to thread, but it all does come together, I think. Uh, Josh weighs in again, Joshua Ray. Have you seen Meyer's Fox follow-up, The Seven Minutes, or do you have any background on its production? On one hand, it seems personal for Meyer, subject to censorship and all. On the other, it's an incredible snooze. Joshua, the only way I know you can see that now is that it comes on a, a, a disc with the British Blu-ray release of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Um, I have never seen it. Um, you know, I know it's based on an Irving Wallace novel, but a censorship trial, and from what I know, it was, as it says, um, Meyer's attempt at a straight movie, uh, a, a statement on censorship. Um, no, I haven't seen it. What I'd really be interested, though, is seeing what he does with the melodrama, playing it straight. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to believe it's a snooze, as, uh, as Josh says, but I, I really would like to see it. Uh, we'll see maybe if he can weigh in and uh, uh, enable that for you. Perhaps he has a source. Although I guess you can purchase that British Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Charles Jacobson weighs in again. Hey, he wants to know uh, if you could speculate a little bit. What if John Waters had made this film? How different would it be? Obviously, Waters is a huge admirer of Meyer. So how how different it would it be is hard to, hard to say. Well, you know, um, <laughs> If we're talking at the time, it would have been made by someone with far less um, experience and film expertise than um, than Meyer had. So that's the technical side of it. Um, and maybe it would have been pushed much more in the direction of the absurd, and um, and because of that maybe not quite as, um, not quite as, it, it would not have hit its targets as lethally as this does, if that, if that makes sense. Um, there, there's just enough here. I mean, the sensibility of the put on is that you're half straight. You're approaching something, you're, you're, putting on but you're approaching something with a, a you know a stone face uh, a serious a, a mock serious face and I think that's the key to uh, why the satire works here I think we probably need to talk a little bit you reference it in your intro um, some of the more problematic aspects from today's perspective, um, uh, the reveal at the, near the conclusion of Z-Man's uh, status as a woman. Apparently he's not uh, uh, trans in the sense of having been a man who's becoming a woman by uh, having, uh, having breasts, but rather that he was always a woman and it's just suddenly been revealed. He was always a woman who was passing as a man. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think movies are, this is not to say movies can never be offensive or can never be objectionable, but I think you really have to work pretty, pretty hard to take offense at something so, um, so deliberately outlandish to begin with. Um, something in which everything exists on the level of ridiculousness. Um, I don't think movies are about social justice. I don't think they're about public policy. I don't think art is about making the world a better place. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't call things out when we see them, but I think there is far, far too much confusion of um, art with public policy and with the uh, with social justice. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think the line I always go to uh, is what Fran Lebowitz said, which is, uh, and I think it, it it's pretty much says what I feel about this, there is not enough democracy in society 
and there is far too much democracy in culture. Okay. Uh, is, um, you know, although some people obviously would find objectionable some uh, portrayals in the film with regard to its gay characters and this mm -hmm. notion of a uh, potential transphobia. On the other hand, the film is actually quite progressive in other areas. Uh, the, it's mixture of black and white uh, protagonists, um, although it's very careful, obviously, to have the, the black female lead uh, only be matched up with two black males, uh, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't violate norms from that point of view. And then also, it's sort of positive portrayal of lesbianism. Yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, as I said, I think that um, I think that that scene is is played, um, you know, is emotionally straight. Um, it's it's not parody. I think it is it is rather tender. Um, uh, you know, but again, um, I, I really resist judging uh, filmmakers or, you know, or writers or whatever on, on the basis of uh, where they fall in terms of their, um, uh, the, uh, the positivity of their portrayals. Let's, <laughs> let's say that. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. All right. Well, we are uh, nearing the end here. So if anybody wants to have a last minute question, uh, now's the time. Um, you're, uh, you're almost at the conclusion of things. I did have a little, uh, this is a very minor question, uh, but I, I've been a little confused myself because I've read differing things depending on what it is I'm reading. And I don't have a clear fix on it myself. And that is, uh, uh, Aunt uh, Aunt Susan, Aunt Susan uh, Susan Lake. What does she do? What is her job? Uh, it, it, it would to me. It seems to be. I'm glad you brought this up. Actually, it seems to be there's some sort of maybe magazine thing or maybe fashion. It's it's not clear. What isn't clear to me is what happened with the backstory between her and the Dolly Reed character. You know, your mother is missing. And that I think is deliberately left unclear because it's one of, you know, it's one of those outlandish backstories that you get in, in uh, soap opera. And you're always going, wait, wait a minute, what? Uh, <laughs> so. Um, and Kelly, of course, is British. Uh, so it, that's it, never yes, really Dolly Reed. Dolly Reed, who, uh, Dolly Reed was married to Dick Martin of Rowan and Martin for many years. Um, and yeah, she's British and that accent keeps poking through. Um, <laughs> it was particularly strong at the beginning of the film and then it would waver periodically and almost disappear and then would reassert itself periodically. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, you, you, you notice it, it keeps breaking <laughs> on through. So that even more complicates the uh, complicates the familial right. relationship between right. uh, Kelly. And could have had a reveal that she was really British. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I, we have reached the conclusion. Uh, oh, hold on. Let's see. No. Okay, we're we're okay. No further questions. So we can now wrap things up. Did you have any final thoughts that you'd yeah, like I to offer? Just, uh, I just want to uh, thank you for uh, giving me a chance to speak about a movie that I uh, that I'm very fond of. Um, and thank, I want to thank uh, you and, and, and Bree for, you know, making this so easy and uh, to thank everybody who, uh, who watched. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Terrific. And for those of you who are watching and who want to recommend this to others, uh, they haven't missed it. They actually have the opportunity to see this on uh, the Cinema St. Louis YouTube channel. We've been recording this and it'll be posted perhaps as early as tomorrow, no later than, um, uh, than Wednesday. So um, just all of the uh, discussions that we've been having about these films from 1970 are available. And I know a lot of people have been taking full advantage of that. So spread the word, let people know that uh, they can uh, sample the wares even after the fact. All right. Thank you so much, Charlie. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Good night. Good night.